Well, hey there. Welcome. So glad that you can make it here to St. Andrews Online and join us today. Uh, as I'm standing here just outside the church in the midst of Six Points, there is new life springing up even here in the midst of the city. You can look at the, the flower box here and see the flowers. You can look around and see the, uh, the construction, that uh, reconfiguration that's almost finished, uh, and new buildings that will be springing up uh, before you know it. But my friends, Christ calls us to an experience of new life. Not just the, the same old, same old, but to know his life and to experience it together. And so as we join together in worship today, let's hear these words from Scripture. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins.
from the dead Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Heavenly Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We worship and we praise you, Lord. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Oh Lord, we know that COVID has caused such devastation in every corner of the world. But we know that this hasn't surprised you nor changed your plans. Lord, these are the times of darkness where we raise our hands and voices and worship you. You are the light in our darkness. We ask you to forgive our sins, Lord, our constant transgressions in our daily lives. Our thoughts, behavior and actions that don't reflect you. These are trying times where sometimes our patience has been pushed to the limit wherever we are. 
for those of us at home spending every minute of every day with our family members, we confess that we snap over the insignificant realities that close proximity highlights. We get irritable and we say things we don't mean. We have unkind words that shouldn't be spoken. We confess our lack of grace and godliness in words and actions. And with contrition, Lord, we lay our sins at the cross. Thank you, Lord, for dying for our sins so that we can do just that. Lay our burdens at your feet. Thank you that you hear us day and night. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for your gentle guidance, not only in times of trial, but always. We give thanks for Canada, Lord, a country where we can worship freely, a country which gives us so much more than our basic needs. Thank you for our medical facilities and the medical and frontline workers who save so many lives while working through their own stress and exhaustion. Help us to cast our anxiety and our worries onto you. We think of the tremendous impact COVID has had on every area of our lives and ask for your peace as we navigate through this year. Today, we pray especially for India. We can't imagine the desperation that's descended upon its people. You are in control, Lord, and we pray for your presence through their despair as it struggles to contain the virus. May your name be glorified. We also think of the families who lost loved ones in the submarine in Indonesia. We join in prayer and ask that you will comfort them as they mourn. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you will be with each of the families of St. Andrews this week. Cover them with your blood of protection, Lord Jesus. We pray for their health, especially in body, mind and spirit. In your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. to explain or, or, or sum up Jesus and his message, explain Christianity and what it's all about, which of course is something of what we try to do here every Sunday and uh, in various ways at the church. There's a few key words and phrases though that quickly rise uh, to the fore. Uh, for example, gospel is such a key word. Now, it simply means good news. Uh, but what is the good news about? Well, of course, the good news is about the kingdom. Kingdom of God. This is, is another key word. This is the image that Jesus used far more than, than anything else in order to describe God's active presence in the world and what it means to live our lives with God and for God. Of course, uh, love would be almost right up at the top. Jesus says uh, to us, to his followers, love one another as I have loved you. And that almost most famous of verses, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So love would be up there. Uh, and in describing the kind of love that we see in Jesus, another word would be grace. And coupled with that truth, uh, we read in John 1.14 that Jesus came full of grace and truth. And it's always important to note that it's not half of one and half of the other, 50-50, but full of grace and full of truth. So these are, are some of the key words and phrases, but there are many more. Well, there's one that I'd like to focus on today as we continue our series, uh, Rise and Shine. Right, We're talking about resurrection and new life. And new life, that's the phrase I want to talk about. The idea of life or new life is such a key word, key phrase in describing uh, who we are in Christ, who God is in Christ. 
Now, of course, right now, springtime is a wonderful time of year to see this, uh, kind of the metaphor of new life budding and springing up all around us. But we're talking about so much more than just a metaphor here. Jesus spoke of and pointed to the reality of life in many, many ways. For example, in, in Matthew 10 and, and in some other places, he says, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Right? It's a key idea of, of life. And it's not just about life, but eternal life. It's about abundant life. Jesus even goes so far as to say that he himself is the way, the truth, and the life. In the life of Jesus, uh, we see an example of the fullness and the abundance of life in action, in Jesus. Now, sometimes when we think about Jesus, people, I think, think of Jesus as this expressionless, wooden kind of character, you know, never laughed or cried, just spoke in a monotone all the time. This is not true at all. Sometimes we might get that impression because we're reading an ancient source that didn't write in the same way as modern, you know, novels or, or newspaper articles uh, do. But it doesn't mean that it's true. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Jesus was full of life. I think maybe some old movies from the 60s or 70s of the, the life of Jesus kind of contributed to this idea as well. But you see, in the life of Jesus, we see true abundance of life. We see true fullness of life on display. But the life we find in Jesus is so much more than, than simply as a teacher, okay, as, as an example. What the Bible claims is that through his death, and through his resurrection, it's like a doorway to the same fullness and abundance of life that Jesus knew, that we see in Jesus. A doorway has been opened to that same uh, life for all of us. Now, in one sense, this happens on a spiritual level. Uh, so it's something that we don't fully see or can grasp onto. Um, but it's deeply true, nonetheless. But actually, in another sense, uh, this is a practical reality that can actually affect our day-to-day -day lives in some pretty amazing ways. But let's dive a little bit deeper into this idea by reading a section of the Bible that, that, that talks about this. We're going to look at the book of Romans again, just as we did last week. Now, Romans is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote much of the New Testament uh, that he wrote to the early church in the city of Rome. Now, we're going to look at the first half of chapter 6 today. Now, Paul, understand, when he wrote Romans, he hadn't visited Rome at this point, okay? He, he doesn't address specific pastoral issues or things going on in the church because he isn't as personally known to them as he is in some of the other places that he writes letters to. But rather, most of the letter that Paul writes to the church in Rome is... Uh, it lays out Paul's understanding of the gospel. You could almost say it's more like a theological treatise on uh, Christianity than it is a, a letter. But that's what he puts into this letter to the church in Rome. Now, after some general opening words and greetings, Paul begins with the bad news, so to speak. The bad news is the sinfulness of all people, Jew and Gentile, all people, as he famously says in chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So really, the second, from the second half of chapter 1 through the middle of chapter 3, it's all about sin and the sinfulness of all people. Okay, But then he goes on to the good news, the good news of God's grace, God's uh, grace, the kind of love, the unmerited love and favor that he pours out upon us, and the way God justifies us through our faith and our trust in Jesus. And we talked a lot about this idea of what it means to be justified last week, that uh, it's just as if I'd never sinned, that God uh, declares us to be righteous, even though in our own sinful state we're not. But through Christ, that's what he does for us. 
But now in chapter six and seven, he goes on, he wants to clarify what was a common misconception uh, about the gospel, a misconception I think that we still come across today. And, and perhaps you might have even fallen into this misconception at times yourself. I know I have. See, if God offers grace, again, grace being God's indiscriminate love, okay, his, his grace-saturated embrace, his, his unmerited favor, and if God has justified us, made it just as if I'd never sinned, then why would we worry about sin at all? I mean, hasn't it been taken care of? You know, if, if as Paul stated in, in Romans 5.20, that where sin increased, grace increased all the more, then maybe, maybe we could even say that sin is a good thing? And that's part of the misconception that Paul wants to address here. No, sin is not a good thing, uh, or even a neutral thing. And this is what Paul goes on to clarify. So let's jump in to Romans chapter 6, and we're going to start with verses 1 to 4. Here's what he says. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We're those who've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Okay, so Paul's claim here is that all who've put their faith, in other words, their trust, when we, when we read the word faith in the New Testament, it always has this idea of, of a lived trust, not just uh, an intellectual belief. So all who've put their faith or their trust in Jesus and what God has done for us through Jesus, in other words, all who were baptized into Christ Jesus, the phrase that Paul uses here, all who've done so have died to sin. Okay, that's what Paul claims here. Now, something that the early believers, I think, understood more about baptism, uh, maybe better than, than we do today, is that baptism signifies so much more than simply a rite of passage, simply uh, joining the community of faith. The symbolism of plunging down into the water is, uh, and it was always immersion when we talk about baptism in the New Testament, uh, that symbolism of plunging down into the water signified not only a cleansing, the water cleansing our, our sin, cleansing our souls, uh, but also death, right? If we're plunged down into the water, we will die, okay? But there's good news here, too. We are baptized into Christ's death. Yes, we join him in his death, but the ra being raised up out of the water is the symbolism of being raised to new life, symbolism of resurrection, just as Jesus was resurrected. Of course, the, the water and the ceremony of baptism aren't anything uh, magical by any means. They're symbolic. But the deep meaning is that, that all who have been joined to Christ through faith, who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, again Paul's phrase here, have joined him in his death and in his resurrection. And, and so what does this mean? It's not just merely some arcane theological point, but Paul clarifies here what this means is that this happened in order that we too, not just Christ, but we too in Christ may live a new life. Now, I want us to be sure that we understand what I mean when I use the word sin. Again, the first part of Romans is all wrapped up in this idea of sin. All people uh, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word sin is usually thought of as referring to moral transgressions, moral failures of some sort. Okay, I sinned in this way and in that way. I, I uh, cheated on my taxes. I, um, you know, told a lie. Things like that. Uh, worse things, <laughs> uh, things that maybe don't seem so bad. But this is sin moral failures or transgressions, right? Well, sin in a biblical sense includes those things, but it means so much more as well, has a, has a deeper, fuller meaning. See, sin is about missing the mark of who we are and who we were always intended to be as human beings, okay? In other words, fully alive, joy-filled image bearers of God. I actually spoke about this a little bit more a couple of weeks ago, so I won't go any further into that. 
just right now. But that's what we're missing the mark of, being fully alive, joy-filled image bearers of God. We're not simply missing a moral target, missing the, the things that we're supposed to do and doing the things we're not supposed to do. Again, it includes that. We're missing the target of life. We're missing the point of life. We're missing out on fullness and abundance of life. Now, of course, moral transgressions and failures, again, are some of the more obvious signs and symptoms that we're missing out on true fullness of life, that we're missing out on the new life that God has planned for us. But Paul now goes on. In the next few verses, Paul now goes on to explain some of the spiritual significance of what this baptism into Christ actually means. This is verses 5 to 10. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now, I think that the key to understanding what Paul is saying here is really, again, this connection between sin and death, or certainly one of the keys uh, to understanding this. As he'll famously go on to say later in this chapter, the final verse of this chapter, Paul says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the wages of sin is death. There's this connection between sin and death. Sin leads to death, okay? Death is ultimately this full and complete separation from God. Sin is that which will separate us from God. Okay? But God created us for life. Not just the physical life, but he created us for abundant life. And ultimately for eternal life. Sin, again, is that which separates us from God and from the life that God has for us, that God has created us to experience. But Christ has died, and thus he's paid the full penalty of sin. He's erased that distance that we have created between ourselves and God. And we, then, through faith, through trust in Christ, we have been joined to Christ. We've been included into his death. Again, we've been baptized into Christ Jesus, baptized into his death. So it's like we also have died. But Paul clarifies, again, not just, just as it's not just for physical life we've been created, he's not just talking here about a physical death, but he's talking about a spiritual death, a, a death to sin. Okay, Our old self was crucified with him, he says. Anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now this doesn't mean, unfortunately, that we can no longer sin but rather that we are no longer under the authority or under the power of sin, but we're no longer, in Paul's phrase, slaves to sin. Okay? The, the restraining line, the, the leash has been cut. Okay? If the leash has been cut, why would we stay with our old abusive master, taskmaster? Okay? The door has been kicked down. The bars have been bent wide open. Why would we stay in our cells, in our prison? The power and the threat of sin is death. Okay? But that power and that threat, death, has been overcome by Jesus' death and his resurrection, bringing new life, not just to Jesus 2,000 years ago, but to you and me today. This is also that we too may experience a new life. But Paul brings down into more practical terms uh, when he continues on in the next few verses. This is verses uh, 11 to 14. 
In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Right here it is again, the idea of grace. We are not under law, we are under grace. Again, God's unmerited favor is over us, is being poured out upon us. All that God has done for us in Christ, his boundless love, is freely available and freely given to us because of his love, his grace. Now, that sounds incredible, that sounds wonderful, and believe me, it is. But this is also where the work comes in for us, for you and me. It seems like this wouldn't be where the work comes. Well, we've just talked about this is what God has done for us in Christ. But this actually ties into the work that we are called to do in partnering with God. See, because life with God isn't simply about sitting back and accepting what he's done for us, and that's the end of it. Life with God is about partnering with him to become the people that he always intended for us to be, right? What do we talk about? Fully alive, joy-filled image bearers of God. There's some work for us to do in that, to work towards uh, experiencing that and, 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 and coming into that, um, that life that we have, that God has for us. See, now that the doors have been broken and now that the bars have been bent wide and snapped, our job is to find the strength, to build up the strength, to be able to walk out of that prison, to walk away from that which has, and sometimes in many ways still does, bind us and hold us fast, to walk away from the sin that holds us and keeps us from being our full best versions of ourselves. Do not let sin reign, Paul says. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin. See, resisting sin isn't simply about following the rules, making sure we don't do those things and do these things instead. We resist sin in order to move more and more into the life that God has for us, to move more and more into the work that we are called to do. I mean, don't get me wrong. Are we forgiven? Yes, we are forgiven. Uh, have we been justified? Absolutely, yes. And, and this one is sometimes a little harder to get our, our heads and our hearts around, but will we continue to be justified even if and as we keep sinning? Again, the incredible good news, my friends, yes. We will be justified even for the sins we have not yet committed. But our response at this point, if, if our response at this point is, well, phew, wow, I guess I, I don't need to worry uh, about sin. I can sit back and, and relax because it's just been, it's been taken care of. Well, if that's our response, then, then I think we're missing the point. According to Paul, we are missing the point. See, even though this is all true, we're forgiven, we're justified in an ongoing way, uh, continuing in sin is not the life that God has for us. It's not the, the life and the hope that God holds out for us. Well, so when we think of sin only as moral failure, uh, transgression, then, then life becomes a list of do's and don'ts, right? Permissions and prohibitions. I mean, is, is, is that the life you're hoping for? Just to be able to follow the rules? Does that sound like good news to you? It sounds like a pretty heavy load to me. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, there, there's truth here. There are definitely good and bad things. There are moral and immoral actions. There are good and evil consequences. But life with Christ, the point Paul is making that I'm trying to draw out here, the life with Christ is so much more. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the ultimate goal uh, in this perspective, tends to become going to heaven when we die, right? If we follow enough of the rules, if we're good, 
then, then we'll get to go to heaven when we die. But that's not the goal. Again, there's truth there. And, and yes, uh, those who are in Christ will go to heaven when we die. The Bible does say that. That's great. But the point is so much more. The goal is life. And not life just in eternity, but life that begins now. Fullness of life. Abundance of life. Jesus came to show this life to us. Jesus died and rose again to make this life fully available to us. And Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit, his ongoing, living, active presence to help us, to empower us so that we too, my friends, we too may live a new, true, full abundant life. Can we not join with the Apostle Peter in some words that, that we shared a few weeks back when he just shares this, this doxology of praise when he thinks about things like this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Rise and shine. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned says
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten, Ten thousand, thousand years, years and then and forever more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Friends, the time has come now for us to end this time together. Although, if you are watching live, please do join us on Zoom for communion at 11.15. But my friends, as we go from this time now, go out into your daily lives as fully alive, joy-filled image bearers of God. Go knowing the life, the new life that Jesus came to bring, that you and I might experience and live together. 
And so my friends, go now knowing the incredible love of God, our Heavenly Father. Go knowing the grace poured out upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Go knowing the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, both this day and forevermore. My friends, rise and shine. Amen. Hello. Thank you for joining us in worship today. Subscribe, like, share, or leave a comment or question below and we'll get back to you. Tonight we will be meeting on Zoom for a prayer gathering at 7 p.m. The idea of waiting on the Lord often seems unproductive in a busy world, so we'll be praying about the benefits of this spiritual practice. The Zoom link is in the weekly email. St. Andrews, we have less than a week to participate in the Spring Into Action activity. We're collecting shampoo, soap, feminine sanitary supplies, toothpaste, toothbrushes, and deodorant for Ernestine's Place. That's a safe shelter for women and children to fleeing domestic violence and abuse. Thanks to those who dropped off items last week. And you can drop off those toiletries at St. Andrews on Monday from 10 to 11 a.m. and Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. so that we can deliver those items before Mother's Day to Ernestine's place. Mother's Day is next Sunday, May the 9th. And we want to put together a collage of photos of you and your mom. If you have a photo you'd like to share, send it to the office email. If you only have a paper photograph, take a digital photo and send that in. We thank you for your financial donations, which support this and other online ministries of St. Andrews at Islington and its mission partners through check, e-transfer to office at standrewsislington.org by hitting the donate button on the website or through the pre-authorized donation program. Now don't forget your bread and juice to get it ready to join us in celebrating communion as one in Christ at 11:15 via Zoom directly after this service. The Zoom link is in the weekly email. If you would like to receive our weekly preview email with special alerts and links to these worship services, special events and online ministries, sign up on our website. Now let's hear from some of our St. Andrew's friends. See you soon. Good morning and welcome to St. Andrews. Uh, as you can see, we are hunkering down in our house and we miss you all. Um, I'm spending more time on my stamps and Janice is just retired. So again, we want to say welcome and, and uh, we miss you all. We miss seeing you, but we have that look to look forward to and hopefully the near future. Um, I've done a lot more cross stitching this winter than I've done in many years. And I'm really looking forward for myself working out in the uh, gardens and the flower beds and getting those ready now that I'm going to have more time on my hands. Um, we do miss you all. We're so glad that you joined us today. And um, please take care and stay safe and stay healthy till we meet again. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Ngozi Uche. Greetings from my family. It's been a long time because of COVID. We all thought COVID would end soon and here we are a year later. We are still trying to be safe. But in all of this, we give God praise. We give God thanks for keeping us safe and protecting us and our families. While COVID has been hard on everyone, but it's been a teachable moment also. I've learned some things I never knew I could do. As I said last time, I started writing and I'm still on it. And luckily a publisher has accepted to help me with it. So we're in the process back and forth. 
soon, maybe two months, three months, it will be out. So that will be a COVID achievement. I'm learning to bake also. I don't have anything to show you. So it hasn't all been bad news. So while we all hunker down, we learn new things, make more time for the family. My husband and I now talk more than we ever do. So we thank God. Blessings to everyone. Stay safe and God bless. <laughs> Hi, this is the uh, Campbell family. Good morning, and uh, we wish you all well. Um, we've been doing fairly decently over the last uh, 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 year of the pandemic. Fortunately, we're all together and we're all happy. <laughs> One of you say something. Uh, the pandemic has been well enough for me and my sister. As you can clearly see, she's been holding up greatly. Um, uh, so, currently, I've learned a few things to enjoy from the pandemic. Uh, I love playing video games with my sister on uh, the Xbox. Uh, online learning, I've learned, that is very just pleasurable for me. And we are dinner. <laughs> that my sister does not hold up well staying inside. Sarah? Hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you again. I have been working from home since last March and it's continued to work from home. I'm looking forward to have my vaccine and then get, get safe to return <laughs> to work. Hopefully we can uh, return to normal as quickly as possible. <laughs> uh, God bless everyone. Singing home, where is your sting?